Well, hello everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, it's Andrew Byrne here and I'm a technical officer within the Southern Beef Technology Services uh, project and I'll be chairing tonight's webinar. Uh, the other presenter tonight will be Carl uh, Tesling. Um, Carl is currently the Breed Development and Innovation Manager with Angus Australia and uh, we're very appreciative of Carl giving us his time tonight. He'll be he'll be the main presenter, uh, and amongst his peers, Carl's certainly regarded as a little uh, bit of an expert in this area of uh, managing genetic conditions with DNA. So we're very appreciative and very much looking forward to what he has to tell us tonight. Uh, for those of you that have uh, been involved in uh, the Know Your Genes webinar course, this is the, the third uh, webinar session in the course. So it follows on from our previous two sessions looking at the, the theory behind DNA technology plus also uh, how we can use DNA uh, to improve the accuracy of our pedigree information. So it's the third session and there will obviously be three sessions to come. So with that housekeeping uh, out of the way, I'll uh, hand over to Carl now to, to start our presentation. Um, now we may just need to change computers here, so there might be just a very slight delay, just delay while we do that. Thank you, Andrew, and um, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope that uh, what I have to say will be interesting to those that are currently um, logged in and also, um, it seems like this will be uh, also made available to be downloaded for those that haven't yet um, been able to attend tonight. So that's all good. Uh, Andrew, just double checking. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, Carl, you're up and running. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, yes, as Andrew indicated, I'm with Angus Australia and. Um, yeah, probably, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing to be a, um, a little bit of an expert in this area, but Angus Australia, of course, had its fair share of having to deal with uh, genetic conditions in the past um, three years, actually. And that has been, at times, a challenge, but I think that um, we've, we've made very good progress in just the ability to manage it and also to build tools to manage it. Um, during tonight's presentation, I'm, try, I'm going to try not to focus on too many um, Angus examples, um, really to be able to give everyone the opportunity to just um, be able to think about their own breed and so that they can focus on that. So without further ado, um, my presentation is going to be an introduction, so I'm going to spend probably five or ten minutes just introducing genetic conditions, what it is, um, and really get your heads around it a bit. Um, after that, we're going to look at management, um, and that's also not only on the member me uh, area, of course, but it is important for breed societies also to be able to manage it, and on a commercial um, for commercial members as well, commercial uh, beef producers. And there will be a question session after the introduction, as well as a question session after the management um, session and then at the, right at the end there will just be a couple of take-home messages. So, um, really what one needs to, first of all, um, ascertain when somebody reports a genetic condition is whether or not it is environmental or genetics that's causing the um, condition or even just the abnormality. In a lot of cases, um, malnutrition, toxic factors, extreme weather, or infections like Kabani and Pestivirus can also cause uh, abnormal calves, and therefore it's very important to, to investigate that properly so that it isn't just made out as a genetic condition before it hasn't been checked properly. Um, of course, inbreeding can increase the risk of abnormal calves, um, or if you, if you might relatives that uh, both carry are both carriers of the mutation, um, you, you certainly run a risk of having some abnormal calves. Uh, most defects are very rare, so um, if the frequency of the uh, genetic condition is very low in the population, normally there is not um, a huge need to manage it, but as soon as the frequencies increase in the population, and that can happen through the extensive 
use of a sire, a specific sire, and that's normally through artificial breeding or um, embryo transplant or AI, that that can happen very quickly. And of course, then the frequency in the population increase and then you, the risk increase as well. Um, the other important point of genetic conditions to consider is that it occur in all breeds and also all species. And we'll quickly have a look at that. This slide gives you a quick indication of the different um, phenotypes that has been identified. So in this case, um, for cows or for cattle, it's about 405 uh, genotype of, uh, phenotypes, so abnormal calves that has been identified and linked back to genetics. Of those 405, um, it was, uh, was uh, researchers were able to show in 115 of those cases that it is because of a single gene that's causing it. Of those, um, 68 has been able to be characterized, so they've been able to develop tests for them. And what research, a tool that the researchers also use is to look at um, human equivalents for specific or for a genetic um, condition or an abnormality and then try to work out um, how does that relate to the uh, cattle genome and that really helps them. So in this case we can see that they were able to trace it back to about 136 different um, uh, or equivalent human um, abnormalities. So but if you start to look at all the other um, species as well one can see that there's a lot of a lot of genetic conditions, um, so it's certainly not only in cattle or in humans. So different ex expressions. It's important to realize that um, genetic conditions or a negative mutation can um, have a whole heap of different expressions. So that can range from um, animals just performing poorly. Um, it can cause structural unsoundness, it can be semi-lethal, so where it seriously um, impact on performance, and then of course it can also be lethal, and that is of course the, the most severe expression is where the progeny die. Um, in a lot of cases it's quite possible that animals abort um, prematurely, and in many of those cases be, uh, um, people don't even realize that they're could potentially be a lethal um, genetic condition at work. So it's important also to keep that in mind. If you lose a lot of calves, of course, people then look at um, the other causes as well, the env environmental causes, but one shouldn't uh, totally forget that it can be a lethal genetic condition as well. Uh, most of the genetic conditions have a simple recessive inheritance. That means that it's controlled by one gene and um, therefore uh, it is quite easy to manage really once you have a test available. So the next important part is then that many DNA tests has been developed and therefore um, we are able to manage it. So I think that is a very simple and quick introduction and um, if there is some questions we can quickly deal with them before we continue. Okay, thank you, Carl. Um, we don't actually have any questions inside. So encourage people now, if they do have any questions, um, just to, to send those through to us. Uh, just while we're waiting to see if anybody does have any questions, um, I just noted when you were looking at the, the different numbers across the different species that there was a little bit of variation between the different species. And for example, the dog had the highest, um, I guess, if I'm correct, you put it back up there. The dog had the the highest incidence, and whether you had any reasons for why that may be the case. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I've looked at that as well. Um, I think that also because dogs have been inbred for very long for show purposes to a large extent, and also to change them to. Um, uh, of course conform with those show um, standards that they put. There's quite a few of them that um, have expressed different genetic conditions. And it also uh, is possible just because it is a companion animal, people look at the animals um, a lot more in detail. They really pay attention to the animal and therefore I think that also just by 
by really concentrating on the animal and if there's anything wrong, take it to the vet. Um, that I think is also contributing to the fact uh, that, or the fact that there's so many um, genetic conditions identified because of course the, the vets get a lot of feedback and I think that that links in almost with what we are asking producers as well is that please um, notify us of any genetic conditions so that we or even abnormal calves that we can follow it up. Okay, a question staying to flow now. So um, a question for you, are genetic conditions specific to a given breed or is it likely that uh, the same con genetic conditions I guess would apply across all breeds? Uh, that's a good question. I think that one needs to realize that uh, genetic condition is usually a mutation of a specific gene. And in some cases like, and I'm going to use some examples, Angus and Murray Gray, there's certainly um, some genetics shared between the two breeds and therefore it's possible that the same gene can actually cause the same genetic condition or both breeds have it. It's not a different mutation, it's the same mutation but because the two breeds have developed um, out of the same original um, genetic material, that's possible. There's also um, clear evidence and um, early on when we had to deal with uh, AM or Arthur Kaposa's multiplex, there were quite a few people that said, but listen, I've seen this in Charolais as well, and that's true. Um, Arthur Kaposa's does occur in um, uh, Charolais as well but it's not the same mutation, so one need to be careful that you don't immediately think it is the same mutation because it could be different. The easiest way to, to see whether or not that's the case, that it is the same mutation, is just to test that breed for it as well. If you've, if you've seen abnormal calves, just to breed that um, or to test that animal and see if it comes back as a carrier. Okay. Um the next one is, are there examples of genetic conditions that are dominant in cattle, so not recessive? Yeah, they are, but of course because you, they are immediately uh, noticed, um, normally they get uh, selected against very quickly and therefore they never become a problem. There are instances where you get incomplete penetrance where um, sometimes that specific mating produce a um, abnormal calf, but in some instances it doesn't, and of course then the, the whole inheritance pattern becomes very difficult to trace, and um, then it takes a lot of, it norm normally it takes a lot of uh, reports to be able to um, ascertain, and or a lot of matings, test matings that, you, uh, that um, the breed society normally, or researchers have to set up to work out exactly what the uh, inheritance is. Okay, uh, the last one we'll take in this session before we get back to the presentation is of the 405 uh, I think genetic conditions that you have shown, said have been identified, are any of them actually advantageous? So in other words, uh, are all the phenotypes bad? Um, I, think of the, I think it was 405 conditions which have been identified in cattle. Well, I think that one can... <laughs> That's, that's a very interesting question because it depends on how you look at it. Um, uh, the, the quickest or the one that comes to mind um, it absolutely up there is uh, double muscling or myostatin. And for some people they would certainly say, hey, that's certainly a, a positive and I would want that in my herd while another sector would say, absolutely no, I don't want that. So I think that um, it does depend on the purpose. Um, and, and even rare gene is a good example of that where it is a mutation and it does depend on what you want to use it for whether or not you, you personally would see it as a positive or a negative. Oh, very good. Um, well, there's one more question here but it more relates to I think the, the next section that you're going to cover so uh, we might uh, move on to the next section of the presentation. Thank you. So we're now starting to look at management of genetic conditions. So I'm quickly just going to touch on the steps that are normally followed to develop a DNA test. And it's very important to realize that um, without cooperation between the different um, sectors almost, it's impossible to um, identify 
first of all the genetic condition and then subsequently also to get material to be able to analyze it so that we can develop a test. Um, so the different steps are surveillance and reporting. So of course that that would be uh, a major role for seed stock and commercial producers, but also for vets. That they are also aware of um, what is potentially a genetic condition and also then for them to get to the next point, collect samples and pedigree information. It's critical that once you've identified an animal as abnormal, to try and um, as soon as possible collect samples of the sire as well as the dam as well as, as the um, abnormal calf. Because that then of course in future make it possible to start to look at which ones are carriers because normally the parents should both be carriers and the calf, the affected calf um, should have a double copy and um, the two parents should both have one copy of the uh, muta mutation or muted gene. Um, then after we've done that, you, you have to look at the genetic basis so, um, and try to work out the inheritance, what, how it's inherited, um, whether or not it's dominant or recessive. As I indicated, most of them are recessive, simple recessive genetic conditions and in that case it is quite easy to develop a DNA test. Um, once you have determined that it is genetic and that it is not just caused by environment, um, and if you have enough samples, um, you can, or some of the researchers, and um, we've worked with John Beaver quite a bit, um, he works on that. He's clearly indicated that the genomic technology is very helpful because with SNPs, of course, you have a snapshot of the whole genome, and then normally what they do is they just start to have a look at um, the carrier animals and the affected animals and how the uh, DNA compare. So that, that's a very helpful tool. Just to show that point and again to, to really encourage people to collect samples and pedigree information is we don't need uh, a bucket load of samples. We only need about 10, as you can see there, um, John Beaver only used about 10 affected animals and between 11 and 17 control samples. Those control samples were just out of the population and we um, he made sure that, or as sure as you can with pedigree, that it is not expected that those animals would be carriers based on the pedigree analysis that was done previously. And so based on that limited number of samples, he, were able, he was able to develop the tests for AMNH and CA. Um, I think the important part is people may say, but heck, I would rather not contribute to the whole process of identifying genetic conditions. And of course, my counter argument to that is if we know and we have a test available, then we can manage it. So uh, we'll get to that. Next slide to just quickly touch perhaps a bit better on that. Um, where we historically had the situation where no DNA tests were available. So immediately when that happens and an abnormal calf is identified, all related animals are also implicated. So immediately you have to say, well, all animals that are genetically related to this animal could be a carrier. And um, that, of course, then uh, put the whole bloodline in jeopardy. Um, the only way to ascertain whether or not an animal is free was by, uh, through pedigree or progeny testing, sorry. And of course that is very expensive, so um, therefore it was mainly managed through eradication where people just said, listen, that whole bloodline, you can't use it because it, any of those animals could be a carrier. So of course now in the situation where we can develop DNA tests, um, we can identify within a bloodline animals that are free and also those animals that are carriers, and therefore we can still use that um, genetic potential of that bloodline and continue to breed with him. Um, Angus Australia have worked closely with AVRI to develop GeneProp, um, which was originally available as a research tool um, through Brian Kinghorn at the University of New England. So we, we developed that to be able to be used in a commercial sense where we now can use the software to calculate the risk. What it does, it looks at the pedigree a um, uh, whole pedigree structure. Uh, in the case of Angus, we now have about 1.3 million animals in there. 
and um, all the animals that has been tested. So animals that has tested free and those of course that has been tested as carriers and then it works out what is the most um, or what is the risk for animals to be carriers based on their pedigree. Another great advantage of GeneProb also is that it focuses the testing effort. So in a lot of cases once an animal has had 10 uh, uh, progeny tested and all 10 of those progeny came back as free, GeneProb would say listen the chance of this sire or dam or a parent to be a carrier is um, absolutely minimal. So and then it, it decreases every time progeny is tested free, it decreases its risk or its probability. So you could end up with an animal that um, that should have been 50% based on each sire and dam that could become um, free untested. We look at the codes in a minute. So now where we have DNA tests available, of course management is possible and therefore it's not necessary to eradicate whole bloodlines. So DNA test results, normally if you only do DNA tests you can get a free, a free animal or a carrier animal, of, of course an affected animal. Um, with gene prop that adds two additional codes in there. So you can see that there could be, um, and in this case I've used AM as our example, so you see AM is in the code there in all of those. Um, so you get free untested, so that means that the animal is not tested, but based on the pedigree um, information available, it is expected to be free. So it's based on the pedigree as well as all the test results at that stage. Um, and then a percentage is the other one where it's also not tested but based on the pedigree the animal has the indicated percentage chance to be a carrier. So where those, um, that line is normally there's a percentage in there in a case where there's a risk. So that could be anything from 1% to 99%. Um, where an animal had uh, even one carrier uh, progeny but it, it hasn't been tested yet. Um, normally that jump up to 99% if the other parent has been tested free because gene props say that this gene must have came from this animal so that's why we never make that um, carrier because of course the animal hasn't been tested. And Then we also have the AMC which is the same as what you would get from a DNA test anyway and affect it. So on our website um, what we do is on the animal details page and also in the sale catalogs, um, online sale catalogs, we have an area that display the different codes. So in that case you can see for AM that animal hasn't been tested for AM but it is free based on the pedigree information. It has been tested for um, NH of course and for CA it hasn't been tested and it has a 25% risk so one of its grandparents uh, probably is a carrier. So if you would look up that animal sire or dam you would probably find that they are um, either of them is 50% at 50%. All right. So the management of the conditions are to a large extent um, only, you only really have to consider three different um, genotypes. So you could have an animal that's free, so that animal is normal, it looks normal and its DNA is normal as well, it doesn't have the mutation. Then you have carrier animals, they look normal but they do carry a mutation or they do carry a mutation and only one copy of the mutation. And Then you have affected animals, those animals you can see that they are abnormal and they uh, normally carry two um, copies of the mutant gene. So then you, of course you go to your matings, so if you mate a, a free bull to a free cow, so um, there's no uh, mutant genes there, all of the progeny will of course be free. If you mate a carrier bull to a cow that's free, um, you, you will have two out of every four or half of the progeny will be free and the other half will be carriers but of course all of them will still or not one of them will show the condition so therefore there's no production loss there. Although they're carrying the gene um, it, it doesn't affect production. 
The only time when you start to have problems is where you might carriers to carriers. And of course, in that case, you have um, the opportunity to have 25% or one out of four, one out of every four calves to such a mating would normally be free. Two would be carriers and one would be affected. So in the case of AM or NH, if you do four matings of a carrier to carrier, one would be um, free and which would be normal. Three of them will look normal, but of course two of them will be carriers, so two of those three, and then one will be affected. So 25% of your cow, uh, cow, of calf crop out of such matings could be dead or seriously um, affected. In the case of AIM and NH, they are, they are certainly dead. So if you then take it the next step, when should one manage it? Um, and there are several um, important factors to, to think about. Um, the economic impact of the condition is very important. Um, if the condition doesn't have any economic impact, then there's not really a major um, reason to, to investigate it or to even manage it dramatically unless um, it has one or another, um, unless it has a problem or uh, impact on the econ economic uh, value of an animal, it's not really important. Uh, the frequency of the condition, in a lot of cases the frequency is very low and therefore you to a large extent don't even know that it exists. Um, so once the frequency increases to a level where you become aware of its existence, um, that is normally already the frequency where you have to start to manage it. Um, the availability of a DNA test, um, of course, if a DNA test is available, that makes it a lot easier to manage. Um, if there's no DNA test available, that makes it very hard because then you really have to start to look at the pedigree. And again, as I indicated uh, previously, um, people will then start to refrain from using uh, whole bloodlines. Um, and that, that's, of course, very detrimental for, for a breed. The, one of the most important um, issues really is if you don't want to have affected progeny, you just need to avoid carrier-to-carrier -carrier matings. So if you know that your cow herd um, is at risk just or that you have cows that could be carriers, you just need to make sure that you use a free bull. Um, if you know that your cows are absolutely free, and you don't mind to bring in um, the condition because an animal has very high production um, for the uh, economic value for other traits, you could still afford to bring it in. But once you have a risk, you need to realize that um, you should avoid carrier to carrier matings. Um, that's normally difficult for commercial herds because they don't keep pedigree information and therefore they, they can't guarantee or they can't make sure that they um, don't mate carriers to carriers. For seed stock herds it's a lot easier because they do keep pedigree information and therefore they can manage that a lot um, easier. Um, also seed stock herds sometimes actually choose to mate carrier to carriers because of other production traits that they would like to increase or improve and therefore they choose to make such matings and um, that is really easy for them then to decide whether or not they want to do it because they can then manage it as well by testing the progeny and determine which ones are free and which ones are carriers. All right, so I think that is that section. So if there's any more questions. Thank you, Carl. Um, there's certainly a couple of questions which have come in. Um, I think just one of the key points uh, that you raised from my point of view is just the importance of people notifying their breed society or um, wh whoever about investigating if they suspect they do have a genetic condition coming up. And one of the first questions we've got here relates to that about if, I guess, um, you're suspecting you, you've got a case, would there be significant cost if the producer wants to get, or if an animal needs to be tested for a mutation? So I, I'm interpreting that question as if we send it away to Jonathan Beaver and start to do some investigative work. Well, for a single um, case, it's not worth it because um, we don't have a reference. Normally, 
as I indicated in the first group of slides with the, in the introduction, is you need to have um, at probably at least about 10 cases where um, an investigation indicated that they are the same phenotype. Um, so normally uh, the first step is to make sure that it gets reported to the breed society. In, in Angus' case, we keep a record of all genetic um, or abnormal calves that are reported. We ask for, for photos so that we have photo evidence and also we ask for DNA to be collected so that we have uh, that on file. Um, in the first instance, we, we normally um, don't, we can't take it any further. But as soon as you have a, sec a second case, and um, preferably on a different property, because the moment you have start to have it on different properties and implicating the same bloodlines or somewhere in the pedigree there is a common ancestor, then the red lights start to flash. And I think that that is the important part, is if you suspect, if you have an abnormal calf and you think, oh, this could be a known genetic condition, that's fair enough, it can be tested. Normally, the breed society wouldn't pay, or Angus Australia would certainly not pay for just every calf that can sent in to be tested for all the um, currently known genetic conditions. Um, but we are certainly interested in receiving samples um, and pedigree information to be able to start to work on it once there is enough um, evidence that it is a genetic condition. Okay, thank you. Um, now we've just had a couple of questions just asking about, we've referred a lot to AM, NH and CA, and just asking exactly to what those conditions are, what we're referring to with those abbreviations. So would you be able just to give a very brief, I guess, overview of what we're referring to? Yeah, they, uh, AM and NH are just abbreviations that we use. Um, the one is arthrogryposis multiplex, and the other one is neuropathic hydrocephalus. I, sometimes battle to remember what they are because we only use AM and NH now as well. And, uh, and they are both lethal, so um, affected calves that, that um, have two copies of that specific mutation die. They are born dead. And of course that is a, a major economic impact and uh, therefore it needs to be managed. And um, that it's based on those that we have developed our regulations to the level we have and uh, to address them and to be able to allow members to manage them. CA is not a lethal, it's but we would probably um, classify it as a semi-lethal. It, it does have production or impedes on the production of an animal and therefore it's it's certainly not not a gene that we would like to, to have in the population. But again we make the tools available for members and for commercial bull buyers to decide what their level of risk is, what they can tolerate, and also then uh, so that they have the information available to make informed decisions. Okay, thank you. The only thing I'd add there, Carl, um, might be just some common common terms around those, uh, which I think is correct in saying, correct me if I'm wrong, but CA refers to what we traditionally known as fawn calf, and AM is what was traditionally known as curly calf, um, for those that, that may be more familiar with those that terminology. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, the other thing, I guess, which came out of your presentation from me was about the, the use of gene prob. Um, and certainly you gave us a really good example of how Angus Australia are using it. And I, I should note that some other breeds are now starting to adopt this technology. Um, in Australia, we have the, the Ren Angus Society uh, with the gene prob. Uh, running on their internet system and also the Murray Grace uh, currently looking at it as well uh, and some of our overseas uh, clients certainly have this system up and running so you will see that software but we have a few questions relating to it um, and one relating I, th I think to the gene prob is if an, anna is if an animal is shown to be affected or a carrier of hypertrochosis then how can it later be listed as free of the condition so how can those conditions change? You, unless we have a different a sample coming in, an animal won't change from carrier to free. So what you could have is you could have an animal that has, let's say, a 50% chance to be a 
carrier, but that is based on each sire, let's say each sire be a carrier and its uh, dam could be free. So what Gene Prop would say is this animal has a 50% chance to be a carrier. And immediately if that animal gets tested and found to be a carrier, it will of course change to a carrier. Or if it's tested and found to be free, it, can, it will change to be free. It will display free. Um, what, what could sometimes happen then is that that animal, that 50% animal, doesn't get tested, but some of its progeny gets tested. Uh, because that animal may have been dead and therefore no DNA available on it anymore. And what GeneProp then does is if the only path through, through that is through that animal and some of its progeny are tested to be carriers, the system will say, but wait a second, for, for its progeny to be a carrier, let's say the sire of the progeny are free, we know that it's free, then of course the, the other animal must have been the carrier. And what GeneProp then says is that the only path to that progeny is through this animal and it will increase the probability of that animal to 99%. So it says, I'm, I'm actually more than 99% sure, but we will only allow it to show 99%. The other extreme opposite is where um, the one parent is, let's say, free as well, tested free, and all of, and let's say there's 10 progeny of this 50% animal tested again, and all of them come back as free. In that case, Gene Prop will say that the chance of, of that happening is minuscule. It's, it's um, normally you expect a 50-50 chance as animals get tested um, and therefore the more animals get tested and if there's no carrier animals in there, the system will start to bring down that percentage up to a point where the animal can be declared uh, free untested. So, but an animal, an animal can't change from tested free to tested carrier without another DNA sample coming in and, and normally when that happens, we we do parent verification on both those samples. Okay, that leads us to the next question, Carl, about what's the positive predictive value of the DNA tests? Um, the, the values for John Beavers are very, very high. But of course what we need to remember is that it is only done by humans as well and there can be mistakes made. Um, and, and that is the, it is, it is not zero, There's, it's not 100% what it says. And we've had instances where um, gene prob indicated that this animal should be free and it came back as a carrier and when we said to the lab, are you sure, um, they normally then don't do only one retest, they then put three samples of that same animal in or two or three uh, and therefore then they get um, of course, uh, much, or then they can double check themselves really. And we've had one instance, and uh, and only one, that an animal has changed. But that is because, of course, human error at the lab and not the test. And I must say, our experience is mainly with those uh, DNA tests that has been developed by John. Um, so I can't really speak for all the other genetic conditions, but of those, we we are very confident of the test. Okay, um, one here just relating to mating carriers to carriers. Um, so you notice there that when mating a carrier to carrier, um, is it an average of one in four calves being affected or is it absolutely um, definite that that's exactly what will occur? Well, what we normally say is if you've done, an, um, if you've done several thousand, you'll find that about 25% will be carrier or affected. So it is looking not at every fourth calf that drop will be, but uh, more at the percentage over hundreds of animals. So one need to be careful with that. We've, you can even look at um, bull and heifer um, ratios. Um, if you have, of course, one animal, it will only be one of the two. If you have two animals born, chances are that it could be two bull calves or two heifer calves. Once you get to three and four and five, sometimes those percentages are 
are quite uh, skewed into one direction, but the more you get, the closer you get to the average, and, and it's the same principle here. So once you have um, uh, six or well, six is even too close still. If you start to get 20 and 30 and 40 of those matings, you will start to see 25 percent or very close to 25 percent would be affected. Okay. Um, question here relating to if a country has a DNA test for a genetic condition, uh, and can Australia get it easily? Um, so, e.g., buy it as a reasonable price. Or does Australia have to try and rediscover a test? Normally, um, labs are, and, and I think that that has changed over the past, I don't know, five or ten years, where um, labs realise that it's not worth their while to try to get all the samples to their lab, and therefore they are, are quite happy to licence. Um, in our case, we've we've got a licence from John. Um, to license any lab in Australia to do uh, those genetic conditions. So um, Angus Australia actually got a license. Um, Pfizer have got their own license directly, of course, an international license with John as well. But um, therefore, I think that um, in the majority of cases, um, the developers of tests are quite happy to license um, third parties to, to do the test as long as they are confident that that lab um, can accurately perform the test. Okay, um, a qu quick one here. Is there a list of specific conditions uh, of relative, sorry I'll answer that, ask that question probably. Is there a list of specific conditions relative to certain breeds available? Um, I've done a little bit of a search on the web in the past couple of days, and there's some articles that are quite good, um, but there's very few that list that 405 that we've that we've seen. There's there's, um, and I can probably supply the link to that website um, in the PDFs that will be distributed, um, so that people can go and have a look at it. But um, it is a research database rather than a um, database just for commercial or for um, for anybody to use, so you you have to want, almost want to do research. Um, there are other um, uh, basically PDFs really available also on the web that has some genetic conditions, but most of them only list about 20 or sometimes I don't even think there's some that list 30 genetic conditions in total. So it's I don't think there's such a list existing. Right. Well, we'll certainly endeavour to put that link uh, in the stuff we send around afterwards. I guess the only other thing I'd say is if people have got any questions, specific questions about the conditions in their breed, um, then to give their SPTS or TBTS tech officer a call. Uh, just one last question here before we move on, because uh, I think it's a, it was certainly a point which came out of your presentation for me. Um, in terms of the management or ongoing management of these genetic conditions, what responsibility should breeders take who continue to register and breed from carrier animals, thus increasing the carrier population uh, in a recessive lethal gene scenario, particularly bulls who can produce large numbers of carriers in one season? I think that um, that goes both ways, is that there's also a responsibility for um, commercial bull buyers to indicate that, they, um, that they're not going to buy um, uh, carrier animals, especially in those cases where that information is publicly available on the internet. Sure, um, the seed stock herd has a responsibility as well, but I think that um, it takes two parties to tango, and in this instance, um, we've, we've, Angus Australia have certainly um, opted to allow the uh, bull breeder to decide um, how he's going to um, manage it in his herd, and of course he needs to consider his commercial bull buyers as well. Uh, but that information is certainly available, and that's that's one of the main reasons why we have developed this tool with ABRI to make it available to all the different breeds to be uh, to be able to supply the commercial bull buy bull buyer with the information. 
Yeah, I think certainly one of the key messages to come out of your talk tonight to me um, was that at a seed stock level within a herd situation, if you do have um, an incidence of these genetic conditions that with DNA technology now you can make two carriers together and 50% of the calves will be free and you can use DNA tests to to maybe not lose out on the, the superior genetics uh, that those animals that just happen to be carriers might uh, have for the other traits. So. Um, well, I think that's, that's covered things really well. Uh, we'll move on now, Carl, just to your take-home messages. Yep, we can do that. Just perhaps on that previous point, Andrew, I think that um, whether or not they, they of course, cull and or cut those carrier animals, um, that, is, that is probably where the previous question come in. And all I can continue to, to emphasize um, is that um, make sure that you look up the status of animals on the internet because um, all of that information is certainly displayed there and it's displayed for a reason so that people can manage it and look up the animals before they buy them to determine any risk. All right, so getting to my take home messages. It's really very simple and um, I've tried to, to keep it as fair as possible. Um, the main messages are all animals carry some negative genes. The incid uh, incidence is normally low. It's easy to manage known genetic conditions and I've specifically put known in there because if we have a DNA test of course available then it is uh, easy to manage them. If we don't know the genetic condition and we also don't have a DNA test then it is actually hard to manage. So, and I think that um, uh, that known is very important there. Uh, if you might um, only free bulls to carry your cows, so if you know that your cow herd already um, has a risk, then if you only use free bulls, you will never see an affected calf. I think that that's also a very important point that it can easily be managed as long as you just, as a commercial bull buyer, just make sure that you buy free bulls. Um, of course, to Go back to the third point really, take photos and DNA samples so that we can actually um, develop DNA tests so that we can make it easy to manage them. So take photos and DNA samples, report all abnormal calves and animals. Sometimes people feel they are, I'm not going to bother um, somebody else with this abnormal calf, but I can't overemphasize the importance of letting your um, SPTS or TBTS or your breed um, technical person um, know that you have had an abnormal calf. Um, the first instances of AM we now know, um, some members indicated that they've already seen some of those calves born in 2003-2004. If they've notified us then, um, we would have been able to nip it in the butt a lot sooner. And, and that just indicates again how important it is to notify um, people at least, and if it's not only your breed representatives, um, just a local vet as well, and hopefully they would also then realize the importance of taking it further. And of course, if you want to do some testing, contact your SPTS and TBTS um, technical person or your breed technical person. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carl, um, for what I think everyone will agree was an excellent presentation.